was now mostly the responsibility of the South Vietnamese. But a handful of SEAL advisors did remain, and men like Lieutenant Tom Norris were still operating on critical, dangerous missions. On April 2nd, 1972, a U.S. electronics jamming plane was shot down in an area that was occupied by thousands of North Vietnamese troops. Only the navigator, 53-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Iseel Hamilton, survived the crash. Also, a crewman from another plane, Lieutenant Mark Clark, was alive on the ground after being shot down. Clark had been trying to rescue Hamilton, who possessed U.S. nuclear weapons information secrets that would be of great value to the enemy if he were captured. The mission to save Hamilton, whose call sign was BAT-21, was memorialized in a book and movie. When Tom Norris undertook the rescue mission, 12 airmen had already died trying to save Hamilton. Rescue helicopters kept being shot down in the North Vietnamese-controlled area. But Norris was able to walk in and snatch Lieutenant Clark from the riverbed where he was hiding. Then Tom Norris headed back into the heavily patrolled enemy area to save Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton. I uh, talked to four air controllers and they were telling me that Hamilton is not making his scheduled calls to them. And when he is, he's not very coherent and they think he's losing, he's not gonna make it. So, okay, we're gonna go after him. Tom Norris and his South Vietnamese partner, Kiet, traveled by sampan to blend in with the local river traffic. And we came out of the fog just below the Camlo Bridge, which is supposed to have been disabled. It was not, but it told me exactly where I was. Tom didn't know it at the time, but there were 30,000 North Vietnamese troops crossing the Camlo Bridge. From that, I had a pretty good idea of where to start looking for Hamilton because the four air controllers had seen him and they had been able to get a, a location on him from that. Got to an area where I thought it looked pretty good, reached the sandpan, climbed up on the bank and started looking and the guy was 25 yards off the bank sitting there in a bunch of, bunch of shrubbery, you know? And when he saw me, of course, he lit up and he started smiling and, uh, yeah, and wave, waving and I went, so we loaded him on the sand, put a couple life vests on him, put him in the bottom sand pan, put a bunch of vegetation on him. Kid got in the front, I got in the back, and we headed off on him downstream. Racing towards their base, the men were spotted by the North Vietnamese. But Norris and Chet kept paddling furiously along the far side of the river, trying to outdistance the enemy when they came under withering machine gun fire. Norris called in air support. Men finally reached the safety of their camp. Doctors later reported that Hamilton, who had lost 45 pounds over his 11 and a half day ordeal, could not have lasted much longer. And as it had for over 10 years, the Vietnam War bled on. In Paris, President Richard Nixon's National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, was in peace talks with the North Vietnamese. To give him more leverage, all military options were on the table, including a massive amphibious landing near the North Vietnamese border. Two of the few SEALs left in country undertook a reconnaissance mission. Lieutenant Tom Norris, who six months earlier made the Bat-21 rescue, and Petty Officer Mike Thornton were joined by three South Vietnamese special operators. Norris, who was scheduled to go home in about a week, handpicked Mike Thornton for the operation. Mike's the kind of guy you think a SEAL should be. He's the big, muscular, you know, I am a SEAL. The rest of us are, I mean, in actuality, most of them are my size. They're not big guys at all. They're, they're tough, you know, average size folks. Tom and Mike's mission called for them to reconnoiter an enemy-held naval base on the Quang Viet River and see how heavily defended it was. Was it vulnerable to being captured for a possible amphibious landing site? I had to go up with the Vietnamese, and they were going to drop us off into small little rubber rafts called uh, inflatable small IBSs. And we were going to paddle into an area and then offload from the IBSs and swim into the beach. 
and do our patrol and then come back out again. The SEALs did not know it at the time, but their Vietnamese boat driver inserted them far north of their intended drop point. We slipped in the water and swam to the beach. Tommy sent me up over, I had a starlight scope, went up over the beach, looked both ways to make sure the areas were clear. Couldn't see the quad yet, but we brought everybody up over the beach one at a time. The men did not find the river where they were supposed to be, but as dawn was about to break, they spotted something ominous. And we're looking around and Mike says, he called me nasty, he says, hey nasty, is that, that what I think it is up there in the hill? And I said, if you're talking about that tank, yeah, absolutely. He said, okay, just thought I'd check, you know. <laughs> we're fine where we are, but you know, um, they're up there, we're down here, it's okay. And uh, it didn't end up that way. There was a patrol that came down the beach and uh, the officer that was with us decided that they thought it would be a good idea to see if we could do a body snatch. He stood up behind the sand dunes and yelled, La de Malin, La de Malin, means come here. Tried to call the guy over. Tried to call the guy over. The guy's got an AK-47, he's got this little... <laughs> and this guy's 100, probably 100 yards away from him and... Uh, Things went from bad to worse. You know, we, we got in a tremendous firefight. The South Vietnamese officer's decision to attempt to capture an enemy soldier by shouting at him ended up alerting the North Vietnamese to the Americans' presence. The two SEALs and the three South Vietnamese operators found themselves overwhelmed by a force of roughly 300. They had dunes all up here, so I would move up here and shoot, and then I'd fall back and shoot, and I'd roll over here and throw a grenade over there, and then I'd shoot. But, you know, by me moving around, it gave them a false pretense as how many people we had. We had a lot had. more people. Oh, yeah, we had we a lot more people. Lot, yeah. Yeah. Shooting and maneuvering. Yeah. yeah. After a three-hour firefight, the North Vietnamese troops began to pull back. But the SEALs realized that their enemy was not retreating, merely repositioning to surround them. Tom Norris used his radio to call in an American destroyer to bombard their position. We're going to be an overrun. You know, this is what I need, and I want you to fire for a fact. Of course, to them, that means you're throwing rounds right on top of us. And the guy comes back and he says, you understand fire for a fact? And I said, absolutely, put it on us. And he said, are you sure? And I said, get it in here. And they did. I mean, they brought it in. Thank goodness. Um, but uh, um, I mean, it was a long time coming. Right? So that, you know, said, Mike, we're extracted. And we started leapfrogging out of there. And I'm the last guy up there. So I'm covering those guys. Until it was my turn to leapfrog out, and, uh, and that never happened because I got shot. I mean, I knew I'd been hit, but I didn't, you know, I had, didn't know how bad. I mean, I knew, and so I'm scrounging around to find my rifle to try and, you know, shoot back, and yeah, I'm seeing tunnel vision come in, and I'm fighting and going, no, 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 because I need to shoot. I mean, I need to cover my guys, and boom, I went out. Later on, I see Dane coming back by himself. I said, where's Tom? He said, Mike Dowie's dead. And I said, stay here. And they both grabbed me. I said, stay here, I'll go get Tommy. Yeah, I thought it was dead, but I wasn't gonna leave him behind. That was a thing that we never leave anybody behind. So I was sure I'm gonna be the first one. When Mike got to Tom's position, it was being overrun by the enemy. I eliminated several other guys coming over the pop. Then I picked him up and started running. And that's when the first round hit and uh, we got blown in the sky. And I fell and I saw him flying off my shoulders. When I picked up Tommy, he said, Mike, buddy, and that's when I knew he was back alive. I had blood all over my face. I mean, I had my brain hanging out, and I don't know what all. Bad guys just shooting at us. And I could see rounds hitting the water. Ching, 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 ching. You know, and pretty soon I'm, I'm kind of losing consciousness again, and Mike's trying to pull me out to sea. Shot through his leg and hit with shrapnel in his back. Mike Thornton was now swimming two injured comrades out to sea. Tom Norris, who was barely alive, and one of the South Vietnamese operators who'd also been shot and couldn't swim. Mike carried them both for several hours before they were finally picked up. The doctor gave him no chance at all to live. His first operation was almost 19 and a half hours long. Nearly a year after saving Tom Norris's life, Mike Thornton would be awarded the Medal of Honor, America's highest military honor. But Norris was still in the hospital. When Mike was to receive his medal, of course, he wanted to be wanted me to be there. We went to the hospital and said, you know, I'd like to be able to be at this ceremony. And they felt that was, I mean, they, 
medically I wasn't supposed to be doing that. So they said, yeah, you can't do that. Of course, that's not the thing to tell. You just, you just don't tell a sailor you can't. <laughs> you know, it's not, not a word in our vocabulary. And uh, um, so we... Uh, <laughs> I just went up there in the middle of the night. Mike, Mike, <laughs> yeah, Mike, he did. Mike kind of kidnapped me out of the hospital. The Navy would, he got so angry at me because I ended up keeping Tommy for four days instead of one day. I told Admiral Zimbal I didn't leave in, in North Vietnam. I sure as hell were to leave in the hospital on that great day. I'll never forget, uh, President Nixon said, Mike, what can I do for you? I said, well, if you could break this metal in half, get the other half of the young man standing behind me, because he saved my life, too. Four years later, President Gerald Ford awarded Tom Norris his own Medal of Honor for the rescue of the two downed airmen. Once he and Mike Thornton both had received the medal, it would be the only time in modern history that one recipient had saved the life of another. Neither one of us feel that we deserve our medals. You may think I deserve mine because he sat next to me now, but did I ever think about it twice, about going back to get Tommy? No, because I knew that he would have done the same thing for me. And that's what type of trust that you have to have within each other to do missions like that. The last SEAL advisor left Vietnam in March of 1973. With another war ending, the special warfare units were once again imperiled by budgets and bureaucracy. The worst time I can remember is post-Vietnam. We actually took United States Navy SEALs out of the teams and put them back in the fleet. At that time, the brain power said, well, we probably don't need that much special operations. That was a, a, a terrible mistake, and a lot of guys suffered for it. So uh, I think the darkest time in the 45 years I've been associated with this community was post-Vietnam, just because the SEALs weren't valued. Funding for...